Even though I've flown a number of times as a passenger in a powered parachute, most of my flying has been in fixed wing ultralights and the two planes that I've owned have fit that category, fixed wing airplanes. And that still represents the largest category or largest group of the five fingers of the ultralight experience. To that end, I'm going to bring you two different fixed wing airplanes to cover what I might call the more traditional, the well-known, which is the Kolb, K-O-L-B, uh, Firefly. And then also we'll go to something that's a more new design that has a lot of interesting new features about it called the Backyard Flyer. So the first thing we're going to do is start with the Kolb. So to find out more about the Kolb Firefly, I sought out Stanley Chitwood. He's an owner, he's built this plane, he really loves the whole idea of ultralight flying, and he really likes his Kolb. Every year the Kolb factory has a fly-in that they call the homecoming. It's a time when owners of Kolb aircraft can come by and they have a big party and they have seminars and also people that are interested in the design can visit and see them fly and talk to the factory. Stanley said he was going to be there and I decided that would be a good place to interview him. Let's see what Stanley has to say about his Firefly. Actually, I've been flying for probably uh, off and on for 20 years, probably. Blue Cessna some. And this is the first uh, ultralight I've ever flown. The airplane flies good. It's pretty stable in flight. It's got a lot of uh, good climb to it. 
It has a 447, 40 horse Rotax engine. Got 22 foot wingspan, 19 and a half foot long. It carries five gallon of fuel. Uh, I use it mainly for sightseeing. For flying, I practice with it. We have a neighborhood group that flies and uh, mainly for enjoyment, for pleasure flying. It handles fairly good in the wind, but you have to be uh, careful with it and you have to be used to flying in the wind. It's a little bit faster than the Quicksilver and it's sort of like a, a little fighter plane. And I'm a 220 pound person. I don't like to brag about that, but it's, uh, it handles my weight and my height fine. It's uh, all around, I think, one of the best ultralights they are. It's the only one for me. It was fun to build. I got the kit, and uh, when I finished the kit, I think it probably took me around three or 400 hours to build it, just taking my time. It has a, a chrome molybdenum, a 4130 cage on it, and it's got uh, aluminum wings and uh, the tail boom, and uh, of course, everything goes together good. You need safety wire tools, a good set of uh, metric, and a good set of SAE tools, sockets, and a good torque wrench. Uh, and it's simple assembly kit. You don't have to be an AMP mechanic to, to uh, all you got, they got a good blueprint, and they got a good instruction, builder's instruction, and it goes all the way through to flying it. If you follow their instructions, you're, you're right on the money. I stuck with the 447. It's the lightest and the best design for it. I looked at Hearths, I looked at uh, Cuyunas. 238 hours on it now. And it's been decarboned twice. Look good. I use the uh, uh, AV2 uh, oil to mix with my gas. And uh, everything not bragging, everything has been a good experience with it. The Quicksilver is a fine ultralight, but I like the enclosed cockpit better. And a lot of, you can get those on the Quicksilver, but it just seemed like the, uh, the Firefly was a, a little bit better set up to, as far as I was concerned, but that depends strictly on the person. The Firefly does what you tell it to do, when you tell it. But whatever you want it to do, it'll do it. And uh, it maneuvers well, it, it uh, takes off good. When I got to where I could taxi it with the tail off the ground, this complete strip, then you pretty much can fly it. Uh, after flying the Cessna and, you know, the Quicksilver, you pretty much, you know, you know what the reaction, you just have to get used to the plane and take your time doing it and get it up to, to a good altitude and get some air under you and then try it. Try it at slow speeds and bring your speed up. Do your 180s and your 90s and 360s without losing altitude, you know. And that was fun to me. I would, for the first six months, that's what I done. When I started learning to land it, I wouldn't land it until I'd use a whole tank of gas doing takeoffs and landing. And uh, it, uh, when I got it down pat, it was, you know, just a matter of learning to fly it in the wind. So even though it's a tail dragger, it's still setting pretty near level, so it don't take much to bring the tail off the ground when you start to take off. And when you come in, you fly it to the runway, and you don't put that tail down to you let it settle itself. Fly it to the runway, put your wheels down, pull your power, and just let it settle. They have a small tail wheel. Uh, it's a little bit uh, rough, and it always makes you worry that you're gonna maybe do a little damage to the tail gear on it, but it takes it good. I've never had one bend. I have bent the struts on my landing gear when I was practicing landing in the wind. 
which is not unusual. The struts are pretty small, and they're made to take the blunt of, if you land one and hit hard, it protects the airframe. So you may have to put some legs on it. You never want to bend them. Once you bend them struts, you don't want to bend them back. They're cheap enough, you can get you some more struts. But, the, but as far as the tail wheel, it's a little wheel and it's a little rough, but it steers you good on the ground, and uh, it can take quite a bit. The visibility on the far fly is above them all. It's, it's just like a picture window to you. You're right out in the middle of it. I fly mine right through the winter. And uh, it gets a little bit cool, but nothing than a pair of uh, uh, flight coveralls. You know, you can, I fly probably more in February than I do in May. Because in February, the air is a little bit more stable and uh, calm and, and around here, the, I live close to Lake Cumberland and the uh, air coming off of the farmland and off of Lake Cumberland can be uh, pretty rough at times. My runway runs north and south, so I get a lot of crosswinds. With practice, you can get the landings down pat. Well, I fly uh, with wind up to 10 knots, you know, 10 knots. Maybe 10 mile an hour. Or, uh, now, but, it, but that's a different subject if it's a crosswind. I can land in a five, seven mile crosswind and handle it fair, but it takes a lot of practice. I've been to air shows and got caught going home and, and fly flown it in 30 mile an hour wind, but it was headwind, you know. And I like to fly early every morning and real late in the evening. That way you have less winds. And uh, around here, the, around 10 o'clock to 12, one o'clock of the day, it, the air temperature changes and you get a lot of uh, gusty winds. And gusty winds are unpredictable because they can grab you and, and whenever you start uh, compensating for them, they can drop you and really ruin you. I've seen several instances of it. To me, uh, the backyard flying, uh, like flying out of my farm, and knowing the community, knowing the county, I know my county like the back of my hand. And that's what flying is all about to me. It's not cross country flying. Flying to me is going over the lake, uh, looking at the lake in the evening when the Signs making it look like a silver ribbon, watching the big 16, 18 row combines in the field, and uh, just generally uh, seeing the countryside, looking over the, the crops as they develop, and, and uh, lots of times you'll see eagles flying over the lake, and I have come down on top where you can see the wide wingspan, and uh, it's just a different experience altogether. That's what flying is all about to me. I usually don't fly over 2,000 foot, 1,500, because when you get above that, you know, you don't get a good view of the ground. And that, to me, that's what I'm doing. It's just what makes, you know, ultralights fun to fly. Getting into bigger aircraft is quite a bit more money. To me, the smaller planes is more about what flying is all about. I was uh, in the Air Force for four years. I was an aircraft mechanic on C-130s, and I was stationed on a Navy base in California. And uh, I was a detachment. We flew C-130s in a test outfit. But the base that I was on was uh, L Central Naval Air Station, and it was the winter home of the Blue Angel. Really love watching them fly and uh, uh, all the colors, you know, the blue and yellow, really, really made an impression on me. But, uh, I, I love the Blue Angels. I like the Thunderbirds, you know. I, I, I like just about anything about aircraft. While we're at it, let me show you a few things about the cockpit on it and the instrument panel. And, uh, 
it's uh, it has the uh, canopy top windshield here that goes back, and uh, this this right here is my own building, the props and everything, and then the, the little instrument panel on it. It has the EIS system. The EIS takes up less space. It's easier to read. It has bigger numbers in it. I can read the EIS better than I can the, the regular instruments. And uh, beside that, you know, it's really dependable. All your uh, exhaust gas temperatures, your cylinder head temperatures are precise. It's like an electrocardiogram. It's when it changes temperature, it shows it right then. So you get a head start on your EGT, which is your, your life instrument, you know, on your engine. Most of you, what you need is right in that EIS system. And you, of course, I have the airspeed, and I have the altimeter and the vertical speed right in the uh, EIS system. Uh, I got the little timer here. This is this little walk-along timer that I use when I fly. I have it on my Velcro. And on the panel, I have a, a, little, a fuse, a main fuse. Then I have the, the block underneath out of the way. And, and this is the air meter, and this is the switch that turns the panel on and off. I usually leave it on. You can see the uh, BRS key handle here. I always keep a key in it when I'm on the ground. That's in case somebody's looking at it and was maybe a child or, or a grown-up acting like a child might accidentally pull that. That, that would inflate your chute and cost you about uh, $1,800. I always keep this in on the ground, pull it before flight, the seat sits back quite a bit, but the seat itself is mesh, and the seat is really, really comfortable. Whenever I first seen that seat, I complained. I thought it would be uncomfortable, and they said, don't knock it till you try it. And when I tried it, it, it was really, really comfortable. It's like you're sitting in a lawn chair when you're flying. On the windshield, I have a long canopy on mine. Uh, a lot of people run the, the uh, short windshield, like they use on motorcycles, and and the short windshield does help you get in and out of the plane better. If you run in the short windshield, you can put one of your left foot over and and then just lever yourself right into the seat. On the long windshield like this, it's a little bit I, I turn around backwards and sit over and then work my legs across. And uh, the long windshield is less noise smoother flying, but it does take a little bit of air off the bottom of your engine. Not enough to hurt. We have some that flies them with no front, no canopy, no nose cone or anything. If you've seen in some of the sport magazines, Brian Melbourne and another uh, fellow from Florida have got a, one with uh, floats, pontoons on floats on it, and uh, they don't have a, they just got a little small pod up here. And, uh, but the long, I'll use a long canopy because I don't like the noise, and uh, I can fly it right on through cold weather with the long canopy. It, help, it, it helps your air speed, the, the long canopy does, and uh, it actually makes it a little bit smoother, uh, you know, flying, cruising. Okay, while we're at it, let me walk around here and show you a little bit about this uh, 447 engine. I'm running a three-bladed Ivo prop, uh, I think it's a 62 inch prop. And uh, like I say, this is a 447 with a B gearbox. This is your main 54 carburetor. It's got one carburetor on it, it's a 36 millimeter. And uh, the fuel pump, the fuel is pumped by the little pulse pump right here coming out of your uh, engine case. Uh, the pulse of the engine firing creates the vacuum in your pump right here. Down here you have a bulb that can prime it with. Some have actually kept them in the air with that little uh, squeeze pump. Uh, right here is your, your ignition and uh, of course your spark plug wires are rooted around in the front of the cowling and up over. I put this uh, supposed to be an automatic balancer on the prop. You can buy them, they're optional. And after I put this on, information that I've gathered, the prop will actually take care of the balance in itself. 
So you really don't need this balancer. Now, I haven't taken it off because I haven't had the propeller apart since I put it on, so I, it don't interfere. The next tire down, I'll probably take it off and maybe leave it off. The three blade's a little bit quieter, and but the two blade is more efficient. Inside the uh, cover here, it's got a, a big threaded shaft that goes through it. When you first put that engine on, your engine should be turning at 6,500 or better RPM. It'll actually go more than that. So you start putting angle, you back the big nut off, and uh, you can put a screwdriver or any piece of metal extension through that hole in your, in your threaded shaft, and you, and you actually turn it counterclockwise to add blade angle. You add a little blade angle and lock it back down, start your engine up, and you take your RPM up, and it should bring your RPM down. When you get your RPM down to 6350 is what I got mine set at, at the top of the throttle. And that's where you want it. Some people run them higher. That's where I put mine. If I'm at any place, any length of time, put these on when I land, especially in cold weather, because it makes your engine will draw that cold air back in and it causes moisture, and moisture can be uh, hard, really, really hard on your engine. I've got 238 hours on it. I've decarboned it twice. I have a custom mount for my muffler up here. This is one that we made after. They had big brackets up here and I, I made a different mount to make it, it's not any stronger, but it makes it look more streamlined and it does the same job. Your little uh, booth that goes in between your carburetor and your manifold here, you keep a real sharp eye on that. It pays to really watch them on a pre-flight because they can crack and you don't, if you don't look at them really close, move them around. And even if you move them around, you need to make sure you don't work it off the manifold. And uh, pretty vital. Always on my pre-flight, I check that carburetor bowl for moisture or sediments. I never, I do it every time, so I never find anything. I use that uh, funnel that's got the uh, water separator in it. And I even carry a small one with me in case I buy get fuel somewhere else. Uh, this plexiglass is optional. They recommend using aluminum or fabric. I like it because it stays in place better. If you want to take it off, it goes back easier. You don't have to stretch it to get the wrinkles out. And uh, you don't have to worry about hanging it, tearing it on something. You might, you might scar it or scratch it or have to clean it a little bit. It's better all the way around, I think. On your 100 hours, and anytime you really want to endow or want to try it, I've got a piece I set up right here on the uh, prop, and I raise it up here and actually track the prop and run the prop through on that line, and the prop should track within an eighth of an inch of each blade. And I do that pretty periodically, and, and I've never, it'll show you if you've got wire and if. You got a blade that's a, a bending or, you know, getting the improper angle to it. But it's a good thing to check. And it, and it, it also, if you're finding, if you're hearing a lot of noise, it's a good thing to check that. Anytime you see anything, you don't have to go by 100 hour. Pays to keep it all recorded. But you don't have to have a 100 hour schedule. If you see something, you think you need to go through it, do it. It's fine. It's not that much trouble. Recently, I had a thing, a little an incident happened. I got to hearing a noise, and I thought I was flooding mine. I got to seeing a little gasoline, and I started going through it from the carburetor. The carburetor level was fine, and I actually had a, a intake gas that was cracked and slipping. And uh, I don't know if that was uneven torque. I didn't, couldn't find no, any cracks, but I pulled all the carburetor off and I checked and put new gaskets in it. 
While I was at it, I looked at the cylinders. Uh, cylinders looked fine. Uh, they didn't look bad at all with carbon. You can take, while you got it off, you can take a flashlight and uh, watch your rings on your, on your pistons, work that prop back and forth, and if, and if them rings are loose, you can see them work, and they'll actually squirt oil out from around the rings. And that's a good check while you got it off or the exhaust either one. While you got it off, it's a good thing to look at that. Something else that I wanted to show you was uh, the trim tab. Now, different planes, some of them uh, don't need a trim tab, some do. It's little things in how you build them, maybe the fabric tighter, but some need them, some don't. This one had a tendency to pull to the right. So we put the trim tab on it, and we put it a little bit bigger than this. I made the trim tab, put it on the rivets and the little ribs. What you need to do is when you put it on, you can start trimming it off like an eighth, eighth of an inch at a time till you get it to where it feels right. Once you get it to where it feels right, smooth her down and let her alone, you know. This uh, the little firefly is probably a uh, a real good choice for somebody that's uh, wanting to get into ultralight flying. It's a good flying little plane. You follow the guidelines and you can really gain a lot of, of learning, a lot of experience, and a whole lot of fun out of them. But they're an ideal airplane for somebody that's displeasure flying, and I'd recommend them highly.